artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. So this is a test. Teaching artists around the world. Test for me, okay? This is a physical <laughs> test. <laughs> It's a fast guy, so no. thumbs up or down. <laughs> I adore this feeling. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. It's fantastic. Hey. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> um, we we're just having a, a tea time with some folks, and um, and a friend, uh, one of Hi, our. Teresa. Hi, Teresa. I know Teresa. Teresa is the poor victim. <laughs> Thumbs up. Thank you, Teresa. Mm -hmm. Thumbs up. <laughs> no, Thumbs up. This is, this is saint. This is a woman. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest woman in the US. <laughs> <laughs> Buongiorno, Benjamin. You speak Italian. Saint Teresa, by the way. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Un peu. Also French. Mm. Well, Verdicchio, your last name sounds very Italian, by the way. Benjamin Verdicchio. Total Italian last name. It's true. Verdicchio. Verdicchio. It's like Verdicchio. I'm fine white wine. Oh, all right. Well, it's fine white wine. I gotcha. Oh, it's so beautiful. People from everywhere. Yeah, it is beautiful. It's like the. It's so beautiful. It's like the Star Trek Enterprise. My last name is Rosania. Teresa. You also have Italian blood. Oh, yeah. Ah, that's why you can manage it. <laughs> okay. Now I understand. Uh, now I understand a lot of things. There is. Ah, now you understand things. <laughs> All right, I'm all good. We're going to just wait a little bit. Everyone just say hello. This is Marinella. She's amazing. Hello, hello everybody. Um, here comes Veronica. Cool. Good to see people popping in. It's Friday for everybody. It's late for you. What time is it for you? Nine? 10 p.m. 10. Oh, there's Bronwyn. Bronwyn's coming, calling in from Melbourne. It's night. Hi, Brownie. Brown, Bronwyn. Bronwyn. Bronwyn's Saturday Bronwyn. for Bronwyn. Bronwyn is is um Irish name by chance. Am I wrong? When I worked in South Africa, I met several Bronwyn. Huh. Yeah. And Winfred Welsh, is oh Win Welsh. You're right, Welsh. correct. The Welsh name. Super. So oh. thank you very much for having me. How many people we expect NATO? I have no clue. How many uh, folks? I think this we're gonna get there. We're almost there. Oh, Winfred just came in. He's call, he's checking in from Accra, Ghana. Yeah, I've never been to Ghana. You been to Ghana? No. Man, I want to go to Ghana. Not yet. Me too. I want to go. But it seems that art is very interesting and fresh there. Yeah. Ooh. There is an artist now. I, I I can't remember the name. Just give me a, a couple of hours. Yeah. Uh, but I know that uh, interesting things are happening there in Ghana right now. So maybe our friend can tell us about yeah. All right. Well, listen, we're going to kick it off, everybody. So this is welcome to our first visiting artist talk of the first quarter of 2021. Thanks for everyone showing up. It's different than our normal courses in so much as um, because there's going to be there can potentially be so many folks. We can't do the grid. So instead, you won't see each other for now. It's just going to be me and uh, Marinella talking for about an hour. And then we open up for questions. We can open, open up for questions sooner if it so leads to that way. And then I will co-host you and you can ask with your face. So have some FaceTime. I'm also letting you know we're recording this and we'll be reposting this on our YouTube channel. That is um, so that a broader audience can see what we're up to. Um, so please join me in welcoming Marinella Senatore. Hey! hey whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, oh, oh. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for welcoming me. Thank yes. you very much for having me. And you're, um, we're talking to you, you're in Rome and you're about to change houses, I believe you said. Yeah, from a poor house to a poorest house. Ah, good. Okay, good. Good to, <laughs> good to downgrade every time. So, yeah. 
<laughs> so um, for those that do not know, I'm going to read a little bio here. Marinella Senator is a multidisciplinary artist whose practice is characterized by a strong participatory dimension and constant dialogue between history, popular culture, and social structures. After the Academy of Fine Arts in Naples, the Conservatory of Music, and the National School of Cinema in Rome, she is dedicated to visual art, where she uses different media, action, video, photography, installation, sculpture, painting, drawing, collage. Apparently nothing's off the table. And I'm sure you could add a lot more to that list than it was just at some point you just thought, and you get the idea a lot. Um, Marinella Senator's art is pure energy. Oh, I like what you wrote here. By the way, this is on her page. This is not my words, but I like it. Um, pure energy, an energy that flows from the short circuit between different elements she relates in the same plate space real or virtual. Indeed, the artist takes on the role of an activator of a mechanism, the work of art, whose purpose is to produce a transforming force from the encounter of the elements included in it, a force that then propagates in the surrounding reality until it reaches the viewer. In this sense, her work can be defined in environmental art, referring to the work so-called developed in the United States and Europe between the late 50s and early 60s. They were conceived as functional structures to modify space, creating another environment often they're different media, aimed at including and activating the viewer, making them participate in the realization of the work itself. My Lord, you know what I think is so fun about that, just to say real quick, Marinella, is this art meets life thing. The question is, when life isn't even enough, you almost want art to meet next level life. You're <laughs> like, I would like it to meet life, but life is too boring. We need it to meet art meets life at the next level. You are certainly, they say the good, you know, they used to say like uh, minimalism was the total art meets life. And I always thought, well, that's just the bar is too low. And I think you work with lots of people. And certainly that's a certain skill set that we can get into. Um, you often work with groups across age, across demographic and producing new encounters amongst people. And you've done that for a long time. It's not like you've done this is new to you. And I, we're going to talk about things you've learned. Um, we have at our disposal two short films we want to do some clips from. And I, of course, want to talk about your school narrative dance. But first, before we get into all that, I want to just talk about how things are going for you in Rome. It's where we are one year almost into the pandemic. Italy particularly got slammed early and hard. How has it been for you as an artist working in Rome? Well, difficult. Thank you very much for the nice message of welcoming even in Italian, thank you very much. Um, difficult as for uh, a lot of people, but also with privilege. So I had the privilege to keep working and uh, even a lot of people were convinced that somebody like me, very focused on participation and engaging so many people, very often thousands of people, in my project and one of the fun restitution of my long-term project is often a performative event. Imagine that I was in bankruptcy, but actually <laughs> my work is focused on the participation, not only as a structure or as a methodology, but also as content. So there are millions of ways to engage people and to reflect on the participation itself as concept. And I truly dedicated my life to that. And so I uh, improved platforms that I already used in the past and that were possible to be activated during the pandemic. And I also restructured a lot my work. So honestly, I can't help myself working day and night recently also because i don't know there in, in well there actually we are we are talking many there's <laughs> yeah many there's but definitely here in europe uh, not only in italy the response of the culture in general not only art but of course i i i'm very critical negative way with art the response and the and the help from the culture in, for the people is pretty inexistent yeah. or uh, and is extremely egocentric and based on the fact that everybody wants to come back to the structures 
as they were before, exactly the fear that I had at the beginning of the pandemic, instead of reflecting how things could be done in a different way and maybe improved and maybe finally open up to the real public. And the real public is not just the circle of friends or the circle of uh, expertise of the art. I'm very bored about this small circulation, this small population, the circulation of information uh, among the same circle all the time. But the, the, the feeling is pretty scary. And I'm reflecting a lot on the concept of caring mm -hmm. and the ecology of the affection. And the affection is a content that I want to include. And I shaped the completely different protocols that honestly are being accepted pretty well by institutions, especially that don't have basically ideas yeah. how to deal with all that. And still, I don't see a big reaction by the artist. I also understand that maybe this time is fruitful for intimacy, understanding and reflection. But again, we cannot leave we have a social role. We cannot leave people completely alone without uh, any uh, responsibility. And that's what I'm working on. And the yeah. didactic part of my life is also important. So I didn't give up on that. And I'm uh, lecturing a lot in a lot of university. I'm working a lot on that. I, I'm simply trying to uh, push things move forward. I'm working a lot in the public space. Uh, museum here were closed most of the time. I worked a lot abroad, uh, remotely also. So there are many ways also more sustainable uh, for artists in terms of resources <laughs> and also capacity and forces because sometimes, especially in a certain level of careers, you are literally forced to work uh, and uh, run into burnouts one after another. And I, and this is something that I'm avoiding more and more and trying to, to claim for more rights also. And yeah, and that's so, where I'm So Marinella, in terms of for those that do not know your work, I'd like to, in my best attempt, say a few kind of broad strokes thematics that I observe. Certainly yeah. there is one in terms of a kind of interest of the aesthetics of everyday life, that you are interested in the innate cultures that are already out there. You like to put them into encounters with each other. You like yeah. to take the nascent forms of cultural expression, whether in diasporic communities, communities of different kind of class relationships, and bring them together to produce a new sense of the civic often. And I, um, in terms of that, you know, oftentimes I would say, like most, a lot of my favorite artists whose work at times you can almost not notice because they are the world in front of you, just reorganized, you know, it's, um, but I want to talk, can you give a kind of paint a picture of how that, that journey began, your interest in the everyday, your interest in the kind of almost folkloric or hidden aesthetics that, that are, 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 are within the kind of daily life of a city or a neighborhood. Oh, Dan and Nelson, you are right. Uh, Neto must write all our statements. <laughs> I totally agree with you. <laughs> we should hire this guy. No one reads <laughs> them anyway. No one reads them. No one reads them. It doesn't matter. <laughs> No, no, no. I I agree with Dan. Yeah. He, he he nailed that. So <laughs> okay, uh, maybe just two or three information just to frame um, also my interest. I I was trained in music, cinema, and I have two degree now two degrees in art. I and also teaching is part of my and. Uh, uh, formation because the didactic processes are very important for me. Also, questioning didactics. So that's why I like very much uh, the alternative art school because I like to start thinking about alternative system of education. Yeah. Um, 
And I founded myself a project which is not a real school as the alternative art school, but I, I called it the School of Narrative Dance. And maybe later we mention something about it. So the multifacetic aspect of my background and more and more discipline that I'm studying because my formation is a never ending process, as I imagine is also for you and for a lot of other people, um, tells a lot about how I deal with uh, people because all these languages are for me simply tools in order to communicate and create uh, liaison, connection with other humans and uh, traditions, uh, vernacular, even gesture. That's mm. also my interest in body movements, in mindful movements, uh, in traditional music and dance, because uh, there is something that reminds you the collective aggregation, uh, even in the dance. I'm not focusing on athletic gesture. Uh, when I work with dance and I work a lot, with the choreographers and uh, completely no professional uh, uh, dancers at all, uh, we try to find uh, a way to create and generate new ideas of community. In that case, using the tool of the dance. But for instance, now I'm preparing a big project for the Biennial of Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, based on parkour and uh, cramp and other urban styles or so urban um, uh, and um, uh, urban um, uh, I, I call them storytelling. By the way, I used to be a break <laughs> dancer. I used to be a break dancer, just so you know. You do that? I used to. I still can. Sort of. Well, if you can, we have to check, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was very Hold on. No, I'll do it. I'll do it later. My name was called Sweet Pea. But yes, but I did not do parkour. I will break every limb in my body jumping off like some so, sort of uh, uh, parking uh, barrier or parkour, something like that. But I promise that parkour is suitable even for very old people, even for super, super young kids, because it's not only about flipping or uh, uh, jumping from a super yeah. <laughs> big uh, <laughs> uh, building. It's also a way to uh, uh, be present in your body and, and uh, refixing uh, your mind and, and your body is, uh, I, I work with uh, people that use this as a tool in order to communicate and create community around that. So mm. again, uh, my network uh, since 2006 so far involved with over 6 million of participants around the world in over 17 countries, I guess, and uh, dozen and dozen, possibly now hundreds of collaborators, teachers, but just the people that I found locally. So my interest lies in what I find in situ. Mm -hmm. When I approach a different community, I never know what I will find. And maybe I get in touch with the cramp, uh -huh or with other situation like it was the case of parkour for instance or very traditional very folkloric also music and then it starts uh, in me also an interest because maybe i find that this can be also a great tool and a great narrative tool to be used again and maybe the same participants of a previous project can can activate new ones in, in a new project. And that's why I also created this incredible network of people that activate other people. Mm. And the final restitution of these big projects can be very often a performative event in the street, because the street is still for me and also for people uh, that I work with, because they were my teacher, actually. Mm -hmm. I learned from them how to make participatory art, social engaged project, community-based project, not very much uh, from my uh, study or listening to artists when I was in uh, school, but from the needs, the desire, the wishes, and the frustration of the, of the people I met. Uh, along my path 
and other times can be even a movie. And uh, what is the meaning of all that? You may ask me. The empowering of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, if I can ask, uh, uh, you can. The, you want me to present to the great host to show Rosa's trailer? I'll, I'll do that right now. Hold on. Here we go. I will be extremely great. Well, then I will. We will do that for you. It's here. just the two minutes and half, three minutes. So I hope you can no understand. <laughs> Unbeknownst to her, really, at that point, she finds herself around about the city centre. dramatic at the end. I love that. Thank you. Let me just explain uh, something about it. Uh, starting from the very end of this trailer, this is an opera uh, for the screen in three acts. Uh, very sustainable in terms of cost. It was produced by three different institutions with very, very reduced budget and uh, joined by 20,000 people. And believe me, my burnout was very big. <laughs> uh, uh, we uh, we displayed in different countries, but I used all the money, most of the money, 90% of the budget of the two different institutions in order to allow the riders of one location to travel to the other location. Taking account that each act of the opera was made in a different city, Berlin, Madrid, and Derby in the UK, a city not so far from London, in different language, because we have over one deaf, 1,000 deaf people in Spain and in the UK. And all these 20,000 people uh, That's well, a lot of people. 20, uh? That number is so big, it's hard to even fathom. 
yeah then i ha i made the project <laughs> even bigger but believe me i thought this would have been insane the bbc told it was the biggest project i ever done no in 2018 we did with three millions of kids anyway <laughs> i don't care about the number the fact is that every day people came 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 and every day i was <laughs> sweating more and more and more and the fact is that all the participants uh, and then i will tell you how i called the participants because this is the main question that obviously everybody wants to know about uh, all these people decided and negotiated with me according to their wishes the role they wanted to achieve which doesn't mean they were prepared for this role because very often it was about their wishes and to be a director or to be a writer and then i found in situ in their cities people able to train them for such roles writers um costume designer, uh, seamstresses, or school of um, makeup and hairdressers, or whatever, really, it was incredible. Even taxi driver provided the transports for free just to get involved into that. So you can really literally involve an entire city if you have uh, good a or good will and good aim. So it was one year long project. And with all these deaf people also involved in the writing session that we had into um, a big stadium, you can imagine 800, 700 people fighting for one character, two character. That was one year long. In Berlin, a group of illiterate people wanted very much to be uh, the writer group. And I said, yes, can you imagine, and I promise it's true, that every single uh, frame was shooted by a person that never touched the camera before and mm. were trained for that, never set a, lie, a light, mm -hmm. never worked with the body, the, the the ladies, the very young ladies that are dancing at the very end of the trailer were homeless at that time the, uh, from uh, um, from Africa that we found in uh, Red uh, Cross premises in Madrid. And we discovered that they were amazing, amazing dancers. Very vulnerable groups became the leading groups. So completely subverting the uh, status quo of uh, social structure. Can I, hey, Marinella, in terms of that, just let me ask, you know, when you work with folks that haven't done a certain thing before, certainly you're going to have beginner's mistakes and basic things. How do you make sure that, you know, is there a responsibility for you as the artist to make sure they don't make something that they're embarrassed by or that they feel like isn't, you know, because surely some people are nervous and reasonably so when you've never done something. And then some, everyone's going to see it. So how do you assure that they come out feeling okay about it? Or what is your, how, how do you deal with that kind of complexity? I, I take on a sort of an agreement with them uh, that I will guarantee for their dignity. Mm -hmm. And so they used to trust me and in my world. So if I, if I ask them to train a bit more on this, or maybe to listen to uh, we share ideas and we share ideas also with the people that are training that possibly are their neighbors because they can can be their neighbors not i don't like the hierarchy of very frontal didactic process no so i don't used to bring my own collaborators or the best costume designer in the world i used to find or I, I try to find local energies to be activated and to activate their own neighbors or uh, or the citizen of the same place. So local energies that activate other local energies. And so they try, they used to trust in me. And uh, this trusting process is the core of the project. So in this case, I take on the role of the guarant uh, um, I. I have a difficult time in that, but 
I'm happy that I have, I must, somebody must have the responsibility to say, okay, you won't be affected by that. This uh, experience will be an empowering experience, not an humiliation. And, uh, and then uh, this is possible if I am very well trained and if I prepare myself properly. And also if I have the humility and uh, the humbleness to withdraw myself sometimes. The numbers are so big, it's hard to fathom the bureaucracy that you need to muster to, to basically deal with so many people simultaneously. Does that require a large team? Or how do you distribute responsibility on such a large scale project? In that case, it was a mess. <laughs> uh, then I improved. <laughs> I improved. And uh, instead of big team, um, I work with the right team, uh -huh. which means that good project managers, even if they are not hundreds, but the right person, uh, are crucial. Yeah. And uh, then uh, another key factor is to work with previous participants. Mm -hmm. And actually, the best team that I can have is composed by previous participants. Mm -hmm and they help as nobody else in working with the new ones. Mm, that's interesting. At that time, the time of Rosas, 2012, I was younger and I was less experienced and um, it was fantastic in UK, but it was a mess, for instance, in Madrid. And it was extremely difficult in Germany because I didn't speak very well German. Um, yeah, we survived, we did it because I guarantee for them, so I had to, uh, but it was extremely time consuming um, and uh, energy consuming and whatever. We did. We did also because if somebody is giving you time of their life for free and they are doing this process and they, are, they want to make this project so bad, so bad, and this project become their project. Yeah. And in fact, it is their project. It's our project at the end. It's not anymore, my, only mine. Um, they want to reach the very end. They want to see the result of their efforts. So their energy and their engagement and commitment allow you to resolve a lot of issue and problems. So they become a volunteers, organizers, they become volunteer project manager. So it's incredible how they self prepare themselves in a certain way, they self organize themselves and their resources in order to uh, achieve uh, the final result. Should we show a, f a, a clip from Nui, Nui Simu? Did you want yes. to show that too? Nui Simu means that's us. In English, it's a Sicilian dialect. This is a video even uh, prior to um, uh, Rosas. I did this video in Sicily, uh, the island in the very south of Italy. It's, a, uh, it's made in a city uh, which is an old community of miners, former miners. It was shown at the Annale of Venice. And uh, here, especially at the beginning of this video, for me, it's very nice to show the way I call people because it changes from one place to another. <laughs> the image is freeze. What? It's freeze. It's frozen? It's freeze. Oh, I didn't freeze. freeze. Hold on, hold on. Let me try it again. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. No problem. I got it. Okay, let's see it's here. Just to, it's just to show you different way to reaching out. To Is it okay now? Ah, it's fine for the others. Benjamin says. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. 
Yeah, I also like that. I like very much these meters. You know, here you have people that don't even speak Italian, so you cannot use social networks. You have to use this meter to really communicate to them. In other projects, I have different strategy to invite them. Definitely you have to research and understand the community you work with, otherwise you are abusive and if you are abusive, it's very bad. And then all these illiterate former, former miners became the riders helped by students of the university of the biggest city near the their town. And they broke the, the story and they became uh, director and they choose the actors, their neighbors actually, people that they knew from years and years. And at a certain point, I disappear. That's also something that I understand to do very well. Quanti anni hai tu? Devo compiere 79. Che cosa si occupa, si occupa o si è occupato? Ho lavorato un po' a tutti i posti, ho lavorato un po' anche in maniera poca, non ne troppo. Allora, le spiego. Siccome stiamo scrivendo questo film, questo piccolo cortometraggio che verrà presentato ad Enna il 31 l'1 agosto, sì. e io lo sto scrivendo insieme a dei signori come Gaetano, che sono degli ex minatori che hanno passato tutta la vita in miniera. Lei è nato e cresciuto qua? Che è Enna? Non ci è andato mai fuori dalla Sicilia? Avevo 15 anni, sono andato a Messina a fare un provino, solo eravamo in 300, ma non si erano presi di 40. Era difficile. difficile. Faccio un passo avanti, sì. vicino alla luce. Lo collocate, ecco qua, prenda bene la luce. Perfetto. E lei cosa fa di lavoro? Io per ora non faccio niente, prima facevo il pizzaio fortunato e perciò non posso lavorare più. Il pezzo del fumo non lo posso eh, respirare, oh. il pezzo non ha spasso. Ma è siciliano lei? Sì, Padienna. Lei che cosa ha fatto? Noi abbiamo fatto il teatro. Ok, we can stop, Neto. Thank you very much. Ok, thanks for the feedback, uh, Zed. Uh, I will repeat what I was saying. Um, uh, it's great to have this chat. Thank you very much. <laughs> and yes, Veronica, it was an impressive turnout. And they became from the humiliation of a life spent in a mine without uh, um, the minimum uh, education. They weren't able to write and read in the condition of uh, the labor condition in general in mines is always horrible uh, and still is uh, horrible. So it's incredible. They became the protagonist of this. Uh, the way to communicate and to ask for people, it's extremely important when you want to open your project to them because otherwise you want a fulfill on your, a fulfillment of your own desire and you can create a very abusive system and when an artist is abusive pretending to make participatory art or a community based project it's the most horrible action that you can do and you can create a big gap between the culture and the public even a bigger one so uh if you approach a community, you must understand the people there. And I do interviewing the people far before and uh, uh, leaving a while if I can there and exploring the city as much as possible and meeting and talking with the scholars, uh, unemployed, uh, going to job centers, schools, uh, shops. So 
the um, more information better for me and there there are people in that a small town that don't speak even Italian. So uh, from the megaphone, the announcement was spread in uh, Sicilian dialect. And of course, if I spread through a social network, an open call for this community, it's pretty difficult that somebody would receive the invitation and even worse, would feel asked, which for me is the first step of my practice. And and yes, that, that was basically what I was trying to explain uh, over the, the, the video. Um, and yeah, they were illiterate. Sadly, they are all, uh, they all passed away because they were already very, very old. Uh, we are talking about people of 95, 96 years old. They don't look like in the video, but they were. And um and they left sicily for the very first time in their life just to go to venice by train almost 15 16 hours by night night train imagine from the island in the very south going towards the north of italy just to uh, see themselves at the biennale of venice and starting imagining that they worth it something um, it must be somewhat by students because of course they were incapable to write and they started also reading a bit uh, help it because then this co different community that are created as a result of this project uh, usually last for a long time and it is our community not based on race or gender or age but based on experiences and sharing of feeling information skills so completely different idea of community yes please Neto, tell me. so in terms i wanted to also um before we run the hour just goes by so fast but i also want to talk about your kind of branching out to fashion you did a project with dior and i wanted to just yeah. think about you know, what I think is clearly coming across is a methodology and a scale and a certain kind of um, a sociological, anthropological passion for the everyday, the kind of complexity that is yeah. humanity. But in terms of these kind of the ways you can apply that to different fields, because I mean, maybe because you're in Italy, it's inevitable you'll work with fashion, joking, but like... <laughs> No, actually, <laughs> because me, uh, it's, a, it's a French maison, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It just seems like it happens. Anyways, can you talk yes, about how the Dior project... More fashionable yeah, than I know. Us. I know. <laughs> can you talk about what you did with the Dior project and also what you yeah. learn in terms of taking these methods and applying them to different circuits, whether it's fashion or film, that there's different worlds that you can encounter with this kind of strategy? But from here, you can Google uh, Dior Marinella Senatore. Okay. Would you, would you like me to, want me to do that? You can do that. Okay. You are so powerful. Yeah, okay, here we go. We're gonna Google this. This usually works with men. Yeah, Marinella, I'm doing <laughs> it, I'm doing it. Okay, I will tell you. I was invited by Dior, uh, the very famous brand. Uh, you know, nowadays fashion brands or uh, also, uh, music labels or whatever are collaborating a lot with artists and of course I'm so multidisciplinary that obviously I adore to make this kind of collaboration but I also knew that working with Dior I would have reached uh, millions and millions of people that are completely disconnected from art and maybe I could have talked to a lot of people more and actually it, it's exactly what happened over 30 millions of people around the world uh watched the the video of the um, the show of the dior cruise 2021 that's the way they call this i don't know why they call the day that the year after well anyway uh and uh, also for another reason, as an artist and an activist, I was extremely intrigued by the fact to have access to big money and to work in the very south of Italy because the, they wanted very much to do uh, something in Apulia. 
in the south of Italy. Now it seems that I work only in Italy, but honestly, I don't work so much in Italy. It's just a case that during the pandemic, I received so many commissions in Italy because honestly, I far more uh, recognized and, uh, and asked abroad than in my country, as usual. But it, it happens that uh, they wanted to make this big project in Apulia, in a very beautiful city, very, very poor in any case, that is called the Lecce. And through this project, I could have offered a lot of jobs to uh, craftsmen. And um, thank you. Let's see. You're what welcome. We found. It's a YouTube video that's pretty extensive in terms of the project. Yeah, because it's the, the entire uh, show. And I also decided that I wanted to uh open up uh um even for italy this idea that collaborating and mixing different discipline i don't know in your different countries but in my country uh it's not considered something pure to mix art with something else which for me is horrible uh -huh. It's very bourgeois, horrible concept. And so I wanted to be uh, the, again, somebody who pushed the boundaries and uh, make some, make people a bit shocked with very silly things at the end. But it's, this was the result actually, because still people are asking me why you did that? Why you did that? It makes sense <laughs> why I, you did it. I just, let me ask you something in terms of working with a, a fashion brand, you know, sometimes the only thing is that they um, they say they love artists till they start working with artists. And then they suddenly are like, oh, my gosh, they have so many demands and so many needs. And, you know, they're so used to working with like um, designers for advertising that they're kind of how much they're willing to tolerate in terms of questions isn't always the case. How was that in terms of just the kind of collaboration? Because sometimes it's just a different very, set of very candid with you. Yeah, I worked with the museum that were far more demanding uh -huh. and curated they were super hysterical <laughs> while Dior didn't ask me honestly I, I, I could say exactly the opposite eh? because now it's done they will never ask me to work again yeah. because they never ask twice the same artist they they give me carte blanche as we say in yeah. Europe so absolutely free to do whatever I wanted to do but really, That's otherwise I don't work because well, I'm not I... capable to do. And I didn't do advertisement as, for instance, other, other artists did. I did the set of their uh, show and I had the chance to overlap my installation with the Barocco, which is the original architecture of the place, which is a precious Barocco, by the way. And then the music, which is a traditional music of the, of the, of the area, that area, and a very amazing style of dance. And I could even insert the feminist quotes and other quotes uh, as activists that sometimes I try to insert in my big installation. And I work with this lighting that you will see if you check. These are huge installations made by millions of bulbs. They are called luminaria, which means light, lights. In, uh, and it's a very typical tradition of the south of Italy. These are ephemeral architecture that are aimed to build spaces ideas of piazza and social spaces for things to happen, sometimes very connected to religious matters, other times not, and that's exactly the meaning. And I did also for the High Line in New York, for instance, at Queen's Museum. I did recently for another museum in Florence. And uh, this is a, a kind of installation that I do very often. It's an, an it's an, a kind of installation full of energy where I mix very dissonant and different elements. And sometimes, as I will do also for the Biennial of Brazil, this big installation helps me to activate then workshop or other gathering of people or other situation. 
So in that case, I could make like, I don't know, 20 kilometers of this installation. So something absolutely big and let people work for months. Well, you are entering the Jean-Claude Christo scale of operation. And certainly I know that the Sao Paulo Biennial is the most attended by far of all the biennials. And they have a vastly um, uh, supported and incredibly uh, powerful uh, education department that reaches children yeah. all across Brazil. I was going to, at this point, um, turn it over to some of our students to ask some questions. And just for you know, fellow artists that are attending the school, I'm going to co-host you. So, Mika, I'm going to co-host you, and you can ask Marinella your question yourself. I also didn't say this at the beginning, but just so you know, uh, Marinella will be joining us as an instructor uh, next quarter. Yahoo! Which is awesome. Uh, no, just if they have thumbs up. Okay, just if you have thumbs up. Okay, okay. That Nato wanted me to test tonight. Well, it's not the nice for you, but it's, it's very nice for me. So, Ben, now we receive your feedback. I'm sure that you will receive Neto, but Mika. All right, so this is how it works, um, Marinella. I got to unco host you. Mika will ask her question, and then I'm going to re co host you. So, just this is like me DJing people here. Just bear with me here. Okay. Okay. Super. Oh, no problem. Mm -hmm. Is that you? No. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> oh, wait. Sorry. Because I clicked the link. <laughs> <laughs> that was like such an amazing way to say hello. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I was just so curious. Um, I know you have a background in uh, music and cinema study, but I'm wondering like how you started all, started it all, you know, like how, what motivated you to um, working with people who don't have any like background in art? Um, if you could tell us um, your um, inspiration or the motivation, that would be wonderful. Thanks, Mika. Thank you so much. Let me go to uh, Marinella and have her respond to you. Marinella, I came back to you. She's like, I'm out of here. Goodbye. Marinella? Marinella? Oh, she's gone. Yes. Yeah? Yep. Here, yeah. I uh, I was tell, I was saying thank you Veronica thank you Mika and for all this nice question and Mika thank you so uh, I don't know really where all this started I just realized at a certain point of my formation that I liked very much to experience system of core structure of creation because. After working in orchestra as a professional violinist, I realized, oh, maybe I like this orchestra because I like to make things all together. And then when I attended the National Film School in Rome, I didn't apply to be a director. Then eventually I was a director, but just for money. I applied to be a director of photography and camera operator. So I wanted to be one in a multitude and as person and actually uh, my energy is uh, it's possibly the only real talent that i have so it was such a natural process that brought me to do to do what i am doing that honestly it's just a natural tendency. I'd like to say something more clever than that, but I don't have, a, 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 it, it's just the way I am. And I know that with my energy, I can empower other people. Mm. And, and I know that it works when I activate uh, myself. And uh, my last work, my last project in Florence uh, is titled, We Rise by Lifting Others. And this is um, really my statement because it's what I do every day and what also people mean to me. Otherwise, I will be a depressed uh, person, believe me. <laughs> and <laughs> now I hope I re reply to your question. Sometimes it's just a matter of being made for something or not. 
I think it's uh, important. Also, too, you might have wondered at some point whether or not what you were going on is, in fact, art. Or was there a certain artist that showed you that this was something that could be done? Or is there someone that inspired you as a form of like collective participation that gave you courage to try more things? Well, when um, uh, when I was starting, I I was pretty alone. Uh, I didn't travel yet, I was younger, and in Italy didn't arrive very much information about other artists uh, uh, making something similar. Then I started traveling and I uh, visiting some exhibition of Kim Rollins, then Jeremy Deller, and I started imagining that other people were making things, not exactly the same, of course, but something that inspired me. But other artists, even just Felix Gonzalez Torres, I don't know, or Bruce Naum or so, even just artists that made me feel, oh, okay, maybe the environment of art, maybe this, this system can be free and faster than uh, production. Because in cinema, in movie field, it's not so fast to create as uh, one can imagine. And as I jumped in a different uh situation professional situation i imagine that art would have been the the the, the right one for me mm. but uh the, the people that really inspires me usually are the people that make very different things for from mine and the people that made me learn things honestly these are the 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 artists and the the, the person that are very significant to me Thanks, thanks, Marinella. I'm gonna keep going down the list. Veronica, that means I'm coming to you. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's go to Veronica. Hold on, I'm coming to you. So you, I know you guys are posting questions, but we're just gonna have you ask them if you don't mind. Um, hey, volume, get you unmute. All good. Oh, it's not on muting? Oh, I hate that. Hold on. You know what, Veronica? Can you log out and log back in? That usually helps. And then I'll come back to you, okay? Okay. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Who was the next one? Um, that's so far been my Anna. Okay, Anna, we're going to go to you. Oh, hold on. Stop. Stop. Anna. Hey. Can you um, unmute or no? Is that me? Okay. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Um, well, I was wondering how long uh, would it take for the people involved to, uh, to that are involved to organize or like uh, get to understand the role or like how or how much time do do you take to say okay this is ready we can now show it and how much time on these people's life it requires you know to like per week how much time will they spend uh kind of uh practicing these roles and also um if after all of the show like there will be somehow um what will like people take home after this right like sim like symbolically or economically, like I'm really curious about uh, how would you reward these people's time? Yeah, thank you for that. And it's a question that was on my mind too. Certainly the scale of it begs all kinds of math equations. I couldn't get my straight in my head. So um, Marinella coming back to you. And also if people have clues to, um, for Veronica about how to get the microphone off, that'd be great too. Um, maybe there's something I don't understand. Okay. Gracias, Ana. Uh... So, um, uh, how long it takes, it depends on the final restitution. When it comes to film, which I don't do since long time, uh, usually can be even uh, one year long a project. Uh, because there is a training part which is which can be very long because it's a serious training 
So these people ask for a real training and they receive a real training. So definitely this partially also replies to the second question because in this case they receive a real formation, not for fun, some, something that they can even spend in their lab uh, as, as a job in the future if they wish to so. Uh, in the case of the performance, it's completely different, especially with the body. You need to be very uh, effective, and uh, usually we work uh, uh, with workshop uh, three from three to four maximum weeks prior the performative event. N not more because otherwise the body, especially the body of the non-professional uh, dancers or practitioner. Uh, forgets completely the information and the experience done. In terms of rewarding, people don't ask to be paid. Even I always place donation, especially in, in, in case of associations or groups, uh, because I want to support their own uh, projects. Uh, but they don't. They, they they take this experience as formation, as something that creates an experience for them. So we work. We are focused on them totally, uh, constantly, 24 hours a day for the entire time that we are there, and even before and even after. Then we create the blogs and social, uh, through social platform, we stay in contact in contact for years. I'm in contact now with the people I worked in 2003. So the boundaries is real, and uh, very often uh, they uh, use the experience as a job if they wish. Otherwise, they it happens in the past in a lot of cases that they use the experience to create other experience, not in the framework of art, but to create uh, association and groups together with other uh, people that they met during the, 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 the project. And usually the projects are um, uh, produced by museum. So the economy of the museum is obviously reduced, and uh, but they are uh, treated extremely well. They are not my uh, actors. They don't fulfill my wishes. They don't work for me. We are creating something all together, something that is really there for them. And even sometimes I renounce to things of me into the project uh, in order to give them the priority. So they have extremely clear, honestly, it's, it's very clear when you participate in this kind of project, how fair is uh, the, the contract, let's say, the, the, cha the exchange. I hope it's enough for you this response. Thank you, Marinella. And certainly it is not always easy as an artist that deals with people to demonstrate the kind of equity that's involved in it. And certainly also every culture has its different relationships to that. I've worked on enough of these things to see it always come under the microscope. Um, and, and I've always been like, these people want to be here. I swear they want to be here. But it is not easy always to defend it because it's a lot of complexity there. And so you just kind of have exactly. to say, you got to trust me. You got to trust me. It's all right. But I hear you. Let's go. Veronica, let's see if we can get you to... Um, do this again. I'm gonna try. Let's see how we do. Okay. Hello. There it is. Hello. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao. Marinella. All right. So my question is, um, well, let me first say, glad to Emily. Thank you so much for this great talk. And the other element, I'm following up on um, the Roses film, and wanted to know there the participants you talked about like what's the afterlife so for instance the two women who were from the african continent who were homeless you know where are they now how has that experience affected them because as you said said as artists and especially an artist with a social justice practice we are going beyond just that moment of the artwork but you know how does it live beyond that that one specific moment thank you thanks so much veronica let's come back to uh Marinella here. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Veronica. This is a very dear question because it's the, the response is very dear to my heart, uh, especially because I'm a, an activist against white supremacy and I worked in this against white supremacy all my life. So uh, it's not my intention to work with the ladies like uh, those that uh, I mentioned to you, uh, just to 
leave the, make them live an experience of another life and then leave them alone in their desperation. This would be extremely cruel and I would feel that I used them in a certain way or I missed them or I failed them in a certain way. So my interest was to uh, highlight them their capacity when I realized that they had the talent, but also provide them a structure of support. So through other association involved into the project, this is the beauty of working with the network of association. I uh, propose to them because I can just propose, not obviously impor imposing anything. I uh, encourage them, foster uh, them to enter into this uh, network of support. And then I put them in contact with activists against white supremacy that I knew because at that time I was living between Berlin and Madrid. And so I was very active in this field and they started also collaborating with them. So they found a network where to express their also uh, a lot of problems because the the racist uh, the racism is, has a big degree both in Italy and in Spain and I know very well the situation and we are actually still in contact and one of them is um, working in a gym as a teacher uh, so is is going ahead with her practice with the body and the dance. Thank you, Marinella. Thank you, Veronica, for that exchange. I'm going to now go over to Amit. Um, we're coming to you next, my friend. Um, hey. Hey, bud. Good to go. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I was curious how you approach activism um, when you're making sort of art with it or when you combine the two. And I think I was thinking of, uh, I'm new to it, but I'm thinking of this class that just started taking the time of the era. And she has a like very specific. Um, well, it's the whole title of her class, but she makes it very specific actions with sort of like very specific goals in mind. And I was curious if you approach it the same way. Like with the Dior shirt, did you have a very specific goal? Was there something tied to white supremacy or a topic like that that you've been an activist against? Um, or do you have a different way of approaching Thank you for, thanks for that, Amit. really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I also like kind of bringing the uh, dialogue of Tanya Bergera into the mix, certainly. Um, I'm going to, I'm eager to hear what Marinella has to say. Thank you, Amit. Thank you for the question. Is uh, I would need a bit uh, of time to reply, so I try to resume. I was very active as activist in the past. Recently, for personal uh, struggle, struggles, I stopped because I had I, I was injured uh, uh, during a man, an uprising in Europe, and I had to stop. Uh, but I collaborated with Black Lives Matter in US. I the last uh, uh, the last. Uh, uh, project that I did was with Pussy Riot uh, uh, and in South Africa I'm super active. Uh, as I said, I'm very much focused on white supremacy, but uh, uh, I'm not so active and uh, I'm not so um, radical as Tanya, that I adore, by the way. <laughs> and I um, try to um, engage and commit myself as much as possible uh, um, with my feminist instances and uh, the things that about equality and dignity of laborers and uh, humans in general as much as possible in every occasion. And with Dior, I had the chance to use a lot of money to help uh, uh, family running business in the south of Italy, which is always discriminated in my country there is a big boundaries between north and south and uh, that's why i say i i will need a lo longer time to explain because it's very local uh, the the well my country is uh, is not an no country but the 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 history of north and south uh, maybe it's not so 
uh, not very, very, very cool to say, and there is a discrimination which is uh, very humiliant. I'm from South, by the way, so I lived on my skin this discrimination, and also the um, resources are not well, well reported. So I use it a lot the resource, the economic resources of Dior to help uh, hundreds of local uh, small business to survive during the pandemic. I just see an op- saw an opportunity and I used it. I really appreciate it. And certainly, you know, it, it's one of these things where, the, you know, to dive into what constitutes activism versus cultural production and all the vari- various ways that each of us come to these terms take some time to unpack. It's not certainly not easy to do quickly. Yeah. Um, and I think we all, uh, I suspect, think about the re- relationships between people and affect and community and scales and historical timing and gender create a different kind of complexity that is hard to kind of uh, unpack together. Um, Zeph, I didn't know if that was a question, but I'm going to come to you and see if you wanted that. Just it was more of a comment. I understand. But do you mind if you we do that for you to have you come on? Um, OK. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I, I, I guess if I found that in the, in the form of question, I think I was just following up on that, that conversation around like how are people who are coming in and being participants, like what are they leaving with? And I'm just thinking about that in terms of like another artist who works very large scale with lots of volunteers, um, just Suzanne Lacey, and, and that I had a conversation a few years ago with someone who was sort of work like was being paid to some degree to help kind of produce that event um and that there was um pushback and kind of a like a critique in new york um of that question of like should you know are people who are volunteering are you know is their labor being like exploited by this artist like and i feel like that question comes up a lot in the arts world because of the economics of art where like it all kind of gets funneled through the artist and it was interesting just in having that conversation with my a friend, for me, it was kind of like all those questions. Are like, are you, you know, when you're participating as a, vol- I mean, as somebody else who volunteers a lot, it's like, am I, I'm participating as a volunteer. Am I, what am I expecting to get out of that experience? Like, should I be getting paid for my labor or am I getting paid in terms of the experience I'm getting, what I'm learning, who I'm connecting with, like all of those things? So um, it's just, it was just more a comment that I think that those questions about the, economies of art projects, just story art projects in particular, and the different kinds of like, you know, cash money capital, social capital, political capital, cultural capital that are generated and are in exchange in those projects is just so multi-layered and so kind of hard to pin down a lot of the time. So I'm also just like so overwhelmed by just the logistics of how you manage to get that many people to participate and like how many people, I guess a question might have would be like, who helped you do it in terms of, was there other, were there other people who were paid on staff in some way to help you just manage the logistics and like move all those people around and hold all the pieces? Cause that's just, just like a huge job. Appreciate that. Thank you, Zeph. And um, I can't help but want to chime in because I was the curator on that uh, Suzanne Lacey project. So I have a few thoughts. Um, so one thing I'm gonna just say on that project, if I don't, if you don't mind, sorry, Marinelle, just a second. It's on the Suzanne Lacey project. It was called Between the Door and the Street and had 100 feminist activists from around the city all together. Something I learned as well was, um, while people said it was a critique of the project because folks were getting paid for and that there wasn't childcare, I also realized that it was one volunteer that posted that, that Hyperallergic picked up in a media press. And I realized at that moment, I've learned since, critiques of projects and controversies are more popular than actual political messaging. And the critique took over the story from all these women that were volunteering their time and were not naive. I mean, these are seasoned activists who knew what they were getting involved in. And that critique of the project, which is Suzanne Lacey exploits female artists for her feminist agenda, became the dominant hyperallergic narrative. And I wanted to say that there's also a thing called the media sphere that plays on these things and the ways and vulnerabilities by which these relationships can be hijacked by the easy narrative of artist exploits people for their own gain. And that it's really difficult to build relationships of trust through these things um, in a media sphere that also 
kind of shrouds the way people perceive themselves in it. I just have to editorialize slightly because I worked on that project. And it was very heartbreaking for me and Suzanne to put all this work into a conversation around gender and labor and have it completely so, you know, sideswiped by a critique that was basically a way to kind of undermine the entire project. Um, and there was no place, there's no place in media sphere to have a reasonable conversation. Sorry, just want to throw that in there um, as, a, as a note because uh, I worked on it. But Marinella, um, Zef had some great thoughts to you too. No, but uh, it's fantastic that we have your testimony because actually it's what we need to have uh, the real people involved to talk. Because Zef, uh, what I can suggest, I don't know if this is the response that maybe you expect from me, but, but as an artist 